I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be reading scripture today from uh, John. It's the 15th chapter, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. And for those of you who would like to follow along again, that is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. To give a little context on this, you know, Jesus is with his apostles, and they've already had their last supper with Jesus. And he is trying to get them to realize the importance of this supper. More than that, he is trying to get them to realize that he's no longer going to be with them. He's about to be arrested, tried in a mock trial, and killed. And it is very, very important for them to make sure that they follow his teaching. Even more than that, to stay true to his teaching going forward and act on what he has taught them. So we'll do chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. By the way, note the number of times he says, remain. I am the true vine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, And I, in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. This is my command. Love each other.
I've been told that there will be no kid connection this evening for all the parents that utilize that in the evening service, which is the perfect segue into the Sunday evening service. Uh, 5.30, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Judges, and we come to probably the most popular, most popularly told story uh, in the book of Judges. We're going to be talking about Samson and Delilah tonight. Uh, probably going to look at it a little bit differently than they do in VBS, uh, but I want to encourage you to be back for that tonight at 5.30. This morning we take a break from the Gospel of Luke to, to recognize our fathers. We have, we have new fathers here this morning. We have uh, fathers that have been fathers for a long time here this morning. We have children that are dealing with the first Father's Day without their father. And that's not easy. It's tough. There's been five already that have gone by since I lost my dad, and it, it doesn't. It, just, it gets different. It doesn't necessarily get easier, but it gets different. And like you, I'm thinking about my dad this morning and thinking about the things that I love most about him and the things that were really just kind of interesting about him. My dad came from a generation where when you came to worship service, you, you wore your best. That was just a cultural thing. And dad could walk into the church and he looked like he ran a Fortune 500 company. I mean, he was a sharp dresser, let me tell you. But you didn't really realize that he was a blue-collar guy until you shook hands with him. Dad had really... I always used to tell him, Dad, you got fat fingers, you know? But you could see just, just little, little nicks and chunks out of his, out of his knuckles because he was a machinist. He was a blue-collar guy. You'd never know it by looking at him on a Sunday. But, you know, he was a blue-collar guy. He worked a metal lathe as a machinist, and, and he worked hard, worked 12-hour days. And the thing that I loved about Dad was, it, it didn't matter. He treated everybody the same. There's little things that I, I carry around. This is, this is his watch. He wore it every day to work. It's just a common, I don't even think they make this watch anymore. It's a, it's a Puritan watch. Uh, it's, I don't know how many years this old this thing, but it still works. Uh, the, 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 the gold plating off of it, but it still runs. And, and the fact that he wore it to work every day means something to me. This is his pocket knife. I carry it in my pocket all the time. There's just things that about our, our, our fathers and our grandfathers that, that, that stand out to us. And this is an important day because we remember the foundational teaching about character. One thing he always told me was, leave everything better than you found it. And I've tried to do that in my life. Our fathers leave us with very foundational and important things. Sometimes, they're not always positive. I know there's people within the sound of my voice here in this auditorium joining us online and probably watching at a later time that will say to themselves, I did not have that experience. That was not my life. That was not my experience with my father. And as has been brought up uh, in the prayer that was led, and the communion devotional that was shared, one thing that we need to never forget is that our Heavenly Father is Father of all. Okay? That's the important thing. And so we're going to look at this passage that, that Tim read just a moment ago, and I want to try to get some things out of it that help us primarily this morning, since it is Father's Day, as, as brothers and as fathers to reset our focus uh, on being a Christian father. And so before we get into the message, let's, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together on this day for the freedom that we enjoy in this country to worship freely. That is a privilege that too many take for granted. That is a privilege that our fathers and our grandfathers and uh, mothers and grandmothers to, to some degree have fought to to give us that privilege. You know, I think about that, and I think about a 
a sweet sister who during the Second World War, because all the men were gone to war, she used to fly B-24s between Fort Worth and, and Los Angeles. Lord, I thank you for the strong fathers in our life. The ones that taught us to be respectful, that taught us to, to have a work ethic, that taught us to, to leave things better, at least try to leave things better than we found them, that taught us that a relationship with you is the most important thing in this life. Because in that, we learn that you are our Father, that you are uh, the one who provides everything for us. And so, Lord, we praise you today as our Father, Father of all. Spirit, I ask that this message be your message, that you speak to our hearts in a powerful and undeniable way that helps us to hear and understand the words that Jesus shares in this passage so that we as fathers can reset our focus on being the fathers that you called us to be. I pray that anyone... Uh, participating and hearing the message this morning will be encouraged to reset their focus on being the follower and being the believer that, that you've called them to be. Lord, we, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, there are a lot of distractions in this world for a father. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things out there that pull us away from our families, that pull us away from our relationship with the Lord. Dads have to work more hours. They have to work for less pay. They may even have to work multiple jobs that won't give them the, the hours that one job needs to give them. That's, that's the world we live in right now. Fathers are stressed out. Fathers are dealing with a lot of distractions. The economy that we're in right now has seen the rise in prices. It has seen the rise in interest rates. But at the same time, while those things are going up and up and up, the bottom line is, is that the bottom line keeps moving backwards. It keeps moving backwards from being in the black to being in the red. You know... It's a difficult time to be a dad right now. But then again, with the temptations all around us, it always has been. I can remember a time when I was growing up. And you know, you know when your dad is dealing with something. Sometimes it's very obvious. Other times it's very subtle. But you know, as a kid, you know. And dad was dealing with something. I don't know what it was, either it was, it was trying to make ends meet. Uh, sometimes you, you ran out of paycheck before you ran out of month. Or it was an acute issue, like a car repair or something like that that came up out of the blue. And he was dealing with something. And I walked up to him and I said, Dad, you okay? He said, yes, son, I'm just trying to survive. That was Dad's way of saying, yes, I'm having a hard time. I'm dealing with something. I'm just trying to survive. There's a lot of dads out there right now that are just trying to survive. And family, we need to understand something very important. The reality right now is that most men feel as if they're trying to keep from drowning in the things that they deal with every day, many of which are things, quite honestly, that only they know about. And the reason why is because if they share it with anybody, it will only multiply the stress that they're dealing with. Many times we don't know which way we're swimming, fellas. But one thing that we do know is if we stop swimming, we're going to drown. You ever been there before? You understand what that's like? With all of these things to distract us, to worry us, to stress us out. Fathers, it is very, very important that we take the time to regularly reset our focus. In our text from John 15, Jesus gives some very, very important principles of daily living. And I emphasize that word daily. Daily living. 
to help us maintain our focus in the hectic and stressful lives that we live every day. First, Jesus encourages us, brothers, as fathers to build and to preserve a close relationship with the Lord. As Tim mentioned earlier, you can't miss it. In our text, the word remain occurs 11 times. I believe Jesus was trying to make a point. The word remain or abide, it may appear as abide in your translation, it indicates a choice. When Jesus says remain in me, or Jesus says abide in my teaching, He's giving us a choice. Those words indicate a choice is to be made, and it's our choice, brothers, to enter into and to stay in a relationship with the Lord. And Jesus' encouragement is to remain. His encouragement, His advice to all of us is to remain. And not only to choose to remain in a relationship with the Lord, but to build it and to preserve it. As believers, our relationship with the Lord is the anchor of our life. And let me tell you something. That anchor steadies us in the difficult challenges that we have each and every day. It keeps us grounded. And let me tell you something. When that anchor begins to slip, we begin to slip. Fathers, we need to try and wrap our heads around how vitally important it is for us, for you and I, to be the spiritual leaders in our home. Please don't ignore the following statistics. If a child, let's say a teen, visits our youth group, makes the decision to give their life to Christ, to repent of their sins, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized into Christ. If a teen comes and does that, there's a 3.5% chance that the rest of that teen's household will follow their lead to the Lord. 3.5. If a mother is the first person to become a Christian in her home family, there is a 17%, 17% probability that everyone else in that home will follow her lead. Now don't miss this. When the father is first, there is a 93% chance that everyone else in the household will follow his spiritual lead. Statistics don't lie. Statistics don't have political preference. That's that's it. 93%. Fellas, do you think your role as a father in the home is important? Do you think that your faith is important to the spiritual well-being of your family? Family in a world that is doing its dead-level best to minimize, even remove the Father's presence in the home by blurring the lines of gender and blurring the lines of role. It is vitally important now more than ever that homes have strong Christian men leading them. The impact that a Christian father has on the faith of their children is instrumental and essential to the survival of the Christian home. And the world knows that. The world knows that. Look at what the screen says. The world is well aware of that and is doing everything it can to destroy it. So what does it take? We need to know. What does it take for a man to be a successful Christian father? There's a lot of things. We could be here all month talking about the things that we need to be well equipped to be Christian fathers. But with all the things that that it takes and all the things that we could sit and we could share and we could talk about, let me tell you something this morning. Let me tell you something very, very important. It begins, it has to begin, with a close and growing relationship with the Lord. Think about it, fathers. Let me ask you to ask, ask yourself a very, very important question right now. 
Very difficult question for some of us. When was the last time you gave serious focus to your relationship with the Lord? Because if it wasn't this morning, and if the last time wasn't yesterday morning, and etc., 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 then there's a problem. And the problem is, it has to be a daily thing. So how does that happen? Well, I tell you, it doesn't happen like my science teacher used to say in biology. It does not happen by osmosis. You can't just slip your biology Bible under your pillow, or your, or your Bible under your pillow, go to bed at night, and just know everything you need to know the next day. It doesn't happen that way. So how does it happen? It begins with personal and private prayer time. Let me tell you something, brothers. If you think giving thanks for prayer at mealtime is going to cut it, you better think again. God deserves more than that. God deserves more of our time. He deserves more of ourselves than that. Verse 7, Jesus tells us that prayer is a vital element in the lives of those who choose to remain in Him. Listen to what He says. If you remain in Me and My words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now take a good look at that and what Jesus says there. Brothers, consulting God in prayer helps us to make decisions. Consulting God in prayer, brothers, helps us to rethink our decisions. Consulting God in prayer helps us to change our actions. It also helps us to broaden our perspective. Consulting God in prayer is a pretty smart thing to do. Because prayer opens the door. Prayer opens the door. It opens the door for God's provision. It also opens the door for God's intervention. And let me tell you something. From my own experience, I need God's intervention. It is the time when we experience and receive God's strength and God's guidance that is beyond ourselves. I don't know about you guys, but there are times in my life when I'm facing an issue that is beyond, it's beyond me. It's beyond anything that I can address. It's beyond anything that my friends, my advisors, my mentors, it's beyond me. And I need God's intervention. I need Him to step in and to give me what I need. And it doesn't happen when I want it to. But that prayer time is important. Family, the hardest part of making this happen is finding the time and claiming the place. And let me tell you something. There will always, there will always be something else that you could be doing. But there is nothing else that you need to do more. But even if we do set a time, and we do claim a place, many times we find ourselves interceding in prayer on behalf of other people's needs and on behalf of our needs. And here's the thing. That's not a bad thing to pray for. It's not a bad thing to pray for the needs of our friends and family. It's not a bad thing to pray for for, for our personal needs. But family, we need to focus our prayer time, a big part of our prayer time, on our relationship with the Lord. Because here's why. We need to do that. We need to establish that relationship and then present our needs and the needs of others based upon that relationship. Second, we need to commit ourselves to live by God's direction. And what that means is making God's Word practical by putting it into practice. In our text, Jesus emphasizes several times the importance of being obedient. And let me tell you something, family. Faith has to be more than what we say we believe Our faith must be what we do and how we live it. Forgiveness, holiness, justice, love, mercy, 
and grace must be more than what people hear us saying, fathers. They must be what people, especially our family, see us living. And brothers, this happens when we choose to remain in His Word and within the boundaries the Lord sets for us to live our lives. Child psychologists once did a study. And what they decided that they needed to do, they were going to study children in playgrounds. And so they picked a bunch of, you know, same amount of kids from different schools. Some kids played uh, in playgrounds that were fenced. Some children played in playgrounds that were, that were open, but they were about the same size. And what they wanted to determine was which groups of children were happier playing in a fenced area and in an open area. And how did that affect their behavior once they went back to class after recess was over? Now, there may be teachers here that can tell me exactly what that looks like. Well, let me tell you what happened in the study. What happened in the study was, and the thing, and thing is, I think most people would come to the conclusion, well, yeah, the kids that got to play in the wide open spaces, they're the ones that, in, that, that enjoyed play better, and they're the ones that behaved better once they went back inside after recess. Uh-uh, it's not the way it happened. It was actually the children who played behind the protection and boundaries of a fence that were happier playing and better behaved after recess. Why? Because the children playing inside the protection of a fence felt more secure than those who didn't. Fathers, living life in this day and time is hard. It's hard. But it's a lot more rewarding and secure Brothers, when we live it within the boundaries of God's commands. Now, why is that? It's because God's commands free us. Now, that makes no sense to this world, right now especially. Woo! A lot of tension out there. Living and finding freedom in the commands of God makes no sense to this world that we're living in right now, but it's true. God's commands give us freedom because they show us our boundaries. And when we know what our boundaries are, brothers, we can enjoy life within those boundaries because we know that we live within the protection of God's Word and God's will. Third, we need to remember that the primary command, the command above all commands, The greatest command, if you will, especially for you and me as fathers, is to love others. The basic core expression of love is found in giving ourselves, brothers, to others. Giving of ourselves to one another. And that is expressed in a number of different ways. That's not always picked up on or interpreted by others as love. Our text ends in verse 17 when Jesus says, in fact, Jesus commands, love each other. Now take a good look at that. Again, what does that look like? Jesus says, love each other. What does it look like? Well, let me tell you something. It looks different to different people. There's no simple way to answer that question. What does that look like? Many people are more interested in what that sounds like. Because they are wired with a desire to hear that they are loved. But not everybody's wired to readily express that in words. I feel blessed. I mean blessed beyond words with a father who did not miss a day in telling me that he loved me. I can't think of a day that went by in the time that I shared with him that he didn't say, son, I love you. Blessed with that. 
But he did more than say it. He showed it in so many ways. By working long hours to provide for us, by sacrificing his wants and needs for for our wants and needs, doing without. Family, some men just aren't wired to verbally express their love for their families. But they show it in what they do. And the provision that they make for their families. In our text, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now take a look at what Jesus says in that Scripture that we all know so well. Look at that. And consider this. Family, how much more would not a father who loves his family lay down his life in his blood, in his sweat, and in his private moments in prayer with God, yes, in his tears for his family? Think about that. I've met people, a lot of people, who have told me, you know, my dad never told me that he loved me. But I know that he did. I know that he did because of what he did in my life. James writes in chapter 2, verse 18, But some will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now take a good look at that scripture right there. We're all familiar with it. At least most of us are. What would happen if we exchanged the word love for the word faith? How would that read? Here's how it would read. But someone will say, you have love, I have deeds. Show me your love without deeds, and I will show you my love by my deeds. Now take a look at that. And understand something. For all the fathers who have a hard time saying, I love you, I believe that speaks to how they feel. They'd love to tell you. There's something within them that they can't express. There's something deep inside of them that aches to hold you, to hug you, to kiss you, and to tell you, I love you. But they're just not wired that way. You know what I'm talking about? They would give anything if they could, but they just can't. That is how they live. That's what they're all about. And we honor them today as well. They love you because they show you. And if I had to choose family between one or the other, I would much rather be shown love. Each of these principles that we've looked at this morning are important in staying focused as fathers. But notice that Jesus tells us that there are some very real and very valuable blessings that come with being a focused father in this life. First, staying focused as a Christian will help us to know more joy. In our text, Jesus tells us that if we choose to remain or if we choose to abide in Him, that we will bear fruit in our lives. And family, a part of that fruit comes from a focused life in Christ. And that fruit is joy. Notice verse 11 again. Jesus says, I've told you this. There's a purpose. Here's the purpose. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. 
Now take a good look at that, fathers, and understand something very important. Jesus is concerned about you and I enjoying life. He wants you and I to experience joy as a father. And let me tell you something. True joy comes when we walk with Him. When we communicate with Him in prayer and when we remain in Him. Second, staying focused as a Christian father will help us to be friends of God. Take a look again at verses 14 and 15. Look at what Jesus says here. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have, been made, I have made known to you. Look at that. See what he's sharing with those that are closest to him. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you're my friends. If you do what I lovingly ask you to do, to me, you're not servants. You're friends. Because I've shared with you what I'm all about. You have a friend like that? They share everything with you. There is no barrier. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm sharing with you, I have shared with you what I'm all about. Jesus says, instead, I call you friends because everything the Father has told me, I have shared with you. He's saying, I haven't held anything back. Nothing. Family, Jesus is saying that friends are transparent with one another. And he's telling his disciples, and he's telling you and me this morning, I've been completely open with you. I've been completely transparent with you. As fathers, brothers, we need to be this way with the Lord and with those close to us. Third, Staying focused as a Christian father will help us to receive answers to our prayers. Think about that. Again, Jesus says in verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now let's make sure we understand what that means, because a lot of people don't. A lot of people say, well, I asked God for this, I asked God for that. He didn't give it to me, so I don't believe in God no more. For some people, it's that simple. It's that shallow. We need to understand what Jesus means when he says that. A lot of people take that at face value without considering what goes along with it. Jesus clarifies what he means in verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and what? Bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Do you see the qualifier? What's the qualifier? Forgetting what we ask for. Bearing fruit. That lasts. Let me tell you two things you already know. Number one, we don't always get what we want. And number two, we don't always get what we want the way we want it. And something else we need to understand, everything that we want is superseded by what God deems is best for us. Now take a good look at that. Look at that statement that's on the screen there. Here's the thing. Don't miss this. If we have difficulty accepting that, then are we choosing to remain in Him and walking with Him as closely as we ought to be? If you got a problem with what's on the screen, 
Are you truly choosing to remain in Him? Are you truly choosing to walk with Him and remain in Him as you should be? Because when our hearts become one with the Lord, as we remain in Him and abide with Him, what we want, family, will be what He wants for us. And He'll be glad to give us those things. And He does. Brothers, resetting our focus as fathers is important. Not just on Father's Day, but every day. And certainly not when we've said something or we've done something that we shouldn't have. Let me ask you this as we close. Where's your focus as a father? Where's your focus? Have you been going through such a difficult time that, man, your compass is spinning and you're looking for a direction? You're not focused. Maybe you need to focus this morning on getting things straight. Maybe you need to refocus your relationship on Jesus by responding to His invitation. And there is no weakness in that. In fact, it's probably one of the strongest things you can do. There's no shame in that. There's no weakness in that. There's only strength and there's only comfort found in that. Whatever bag of rocks you hauled in here this morning of guilt, regret, because you said this or did that, or flew off the handle on this occasion or that occasion, you going to carry that out with you? That's not a smart thing to do. Leave it here. Bring it to the Lord. Let us pray with you. Let your brothers pray with you. I guarantee you, if you made that decision right now, you'd, you'd, you'd have brothers coming to pray with you and over you like a swarm of bees on honey. Because we love you. Be the man that God's called you to be. Refocus your life. That may mean confessing Jesus as Lord and having all that guilt and past and all that stuff that troubles you washed away so you can start brand new. That's your choice too. God's not going to make you do something you don't want to do. It's your choice. always has been. You can choose to remain in Him and abide in Him or not. What are you going to choose while we stand and sing?